Up to this point, we've mostly considered field theory in terms of field extensions. Now, we shift gears and look at the problem of factoring polynomials. Recall, we have f a subfield of k, we pick alpha and k, we say that alpha is algebraic over f, if there exists a non-zero polynomial g with coefficients in f, such that g of alpha is zero. So alpha is a root of g. When this is the case, there exists a unique monic polynomial, f sub alpha, with coefficients in f, of smallest degree such that f sub alpha on alpha is zero. Then we call f sub alpha the minimal polynomial of alpha over f. How do we find f sub alpha? We consider the evaluation map from polynomials to f. So I just send each f of x to f of alpha. With that we have f sub alpha is irreducible in the polynomial ring for f, and if I have a non-zero polynomial g with coefficients in f, and alpha is a root of g, then f sub alpha divides g. So this gives a first step in our factoring problem. If I can find a root alpha of g, then we can factor out the minimal polynomial of alpha. Now, that puts the focus on factoring irreducibles. Let's recall some results from ring theory. Now, what makes everything work? We have that the polynomial ring over f, where f is a field, is a Euclidean domain. So that's where we get one and two. Now, for results on roots, okay, first we have divisibility in terms of roots. So if I have g, a polynomial of coefficients in f, I have alpha and f, a root of g, then x minus alpha divides g of x. With that, if we have polynomial g with coefficients in f of degree n, the number of roots of g and f, okay, counted with multiplicity, is less than or equal to n. Finally, okay, still using g with coefficients in f, there's going to exist some extension field k containing f, such that g of x factors linearly in k adjoin x, so as a polynomial over k. Okay, that's the same as saying that all roots of g lie in k. Another way to say this, g has exactly n roots in k, counting multiplicities. Now, let's take a closer look at the construction when g does not factor linearly over f. We recall the polynomial ring over f is a unique factorization domain, so g factors completely into a product of irreducible polynomials over f. This factorization is not completely linear, so the degree of one of the factors, okay, say f sub i, is strictly bigger than one. We form the ideal generated by f sub i. Because f sub i is irreducible, this is a maximal ideal. I form the quotient ring, because we have a maximal ideal, we get a field, and we note that f sits inside of this field as the span of the coset one plus i. Now note what we have here is a proper extension of f, and it's also a finite extension with degree equal to the degree of f sub i. Okay, so for a basis over f, I have one plus i, x plus i, all the way up through x to the n minus one plus i, where n is the degree of f sub i, which we have strictly larger than one. Now, that says, okay, proposition, suppose g does not factor linearly over f, then there exists a finite extension k containing f that contains a root of g, not an f, and the degree of k over f is between one and the degree of g, possibly including the degree of g. What can we do here? We have g, we find k which has a root of g, we factor that out. So what's left over is a polynomial of degree n minus one. Now, that might be irreducible over a residue field, say k1. So we may need to keep repeating this process, and at each stage we're just gonna move up by a degree one less than the one before, at worst. That gives theorem, I have g polynomial with coefficients in f, the degree of g is greater than or equal to one, then there exists an extension k of f 
containing all the roots of G with the degree of K over F less than or equal to N factorial. Here are two extremes of the theorem, both over the rational numbers. First, we have the polynomial, okay, g of x equals x to the 4 minus 1. The roots of g in the complex numbers are plus minus 1 plus minus i. So we have our complete factorization of g into linear factors. We note, if I take q adjoint i, that contains all roots of g, and we have a degree 2 extension. Note, 2 is less than or equal to 4 factorial, where 4 is the degree of the polynomial. Now, this generalizes. If I take g of x equal to x to the n minus 1, where n is greater than or equal to 3, to get the roots, I start with omega equal to e to the 2 pi i over n. By Euler's formula, that's equal to cosine of 2 pi over n plus i sine of 2 pi over n. Now, for the roots of this polynomial, we're just going to take omega and raise to powers. And that's enough just to raise to exponents between 0 and n minus 1. Of course, these are what we call the nth roots of unity. We get a complete factorization of g of x into linear factors as follows. Then we note all roots live inside of q adjoint omega. The degree of q adjoint omega over q, okay, we'll see later that this is phi of n, where phi is the Euler totient function. We have that phi of n is strictly less than n, which is strictly less than n factorial in this case with n being the degree of our polynomial. On the other hand, let's consider the polynomial x cubed minus 2. Here we're going to need omega equal to e to the 2 pi over 3. That's equal to minus a half plus square root of 3 over 2i. The roots of g in the complex numbers in this case are cube root of 2, omega cube root of 2, and omega squared cube root of 2. If we look at the extensions, okay, so first I start with q. We'll adjoin a cube root of 2, which gives a degree 3 extension. Okay, that's not going to give us everything because these are complex roots. So we'll also need to adjoin omega, and that's going to be a degree 2 extension. And we can see that by noting that q adjoin omega is just q adjoin squared to 3 times i. Now, that means if we take the degree of k over the rationals, we get 6, and that's equal to 3 factorial. So in this case, we need the entire factorial. Note, if we do our factorization, okay, we first do our factorization in q adjoined cube root of 2. We break off a linear factor, and then what's left over is going to be irreducible over q adjoined cube root of 2. Then when I factor this, okay, we have to go to the complex numbers. With the theorem, we have the following definition. We pick a non-constant polynomial G with coefficients in F. We define a splitting field of G over F to be an extension K of F of smallest degree, such that G factors linearly in the polynomial ring for K. Equivalently, K is the smallest extension of F containing all the roots of G. Now, these exist by the theorem. So we pick any extension k prime of f that contains all the roots of g. Then our splitting field is just f adjoint alpha 1 through alpha n, where the alphas are the roots of g in k prime. This choice of splitting field depends on k prime, but the splitting fields will all be isomorphic to one another. So the splitting field is unique up to isomorphism, and with that, we sometimes refer to the splitting field. Now, with the notion of a splitting field, you can clean up some ideas about minimal polynomials and irreducibles. So let's suppose we have a non-constant polynomial g with coefficients in f. We'll choose k, a splitting field for g over f. First, g is monic and irreducible. Okay, let's suppose alpha is a root of g, so that exists by okay, the splitting field. The minimal polynomial for alpha over f is going to divide g, but because they're both monic and irreducible, they must be equal. Now, to apply this, let's suppose okay, I have a beta that's also a root of the minimal polynomial for alpha. 
That means the minimal polynomial for beta over f divides the minimal polynomial for alpha over f. They're both irreducible and monic, so they must be equal. To interpret, g is irreducible over f, then g is the minimal polynomial for any of its roots. Now, using that, g is irreducible over f. Okay, suppose I have a non-zero h, okay, coefficients in f, with alpha a root of both g and h. Then I must have, whenever beta is a root of g, it is also a root of h. Now this is useful for when we factor. So if I'm trying to factor an h, okay, and I find a root of h, that's a root of an irreducible, then we automatically have that all the roots of that irreducible are now roots of h. The way we should think of this abstractly is so when I have an irreducible polynomial over f, all of its roots come as a group. Now, right now, this is just putting them together as a set, but we're going to see that there's some structure that binds these all together. And that structure is going to come from group automorphisms. For now, we're going to leave this alone and move on to more factoring properties. The next question to consider, when do polynomials have multiple roots? For here, we'll assume all polynomials factor linearly over f. Now, definition, we'll say g, a polynomial with coefficients in f, has a root alpha with multiplicity m greater than or equal to 1. If we could write g as x minus alpha to the m times h of x, where h of alpha is non-zero. That just means I can't pull another factor, x minus alpha, from h check for multiple roots, we just use the formal derivative. So here I say formal because it might not be defined using a limiting process. Because we're only looking at polynomials, we can still apply our old definition. So constants go to zero. For powers of x, we just drop the exponent and subtract one. Now, this definition of the derivative is still linear and still obeys the product rule. So I'll leave it to you to verify that. One big difference, if we're in characteristic zero, polynomial has derivative zero if and only if that polynomial is a constant. In characteristic p, that's not so. For instance, if I take x to the p, take its derivative, we drop the p, subtract one, and that goes to zero. So I have a non-constant function with derivative zero. That's something we need to work around. Now, proposition, g has a multiple root, if and only if g and g prime have a non-trivial common factor. In this direction, can we assume g has a multiple root? So I write it as x minus alpha to the m times h of x. We need m greater than or equal to two to have a multiple root. Take the derivative, so we apply the product rule, we note the factors of x minus alpha have positive exponents. So when I evaluate at alpha, we get zero. So that means alpha is a root of g prime. Thus, x minus alpha divides g prime. And because alpha is a root of g, x minus alpha divides g. So they have the common factor x minus alpha. In the other direction, okay, we're going to use the contrapositive. So we'll assume that g has no multiple roots. Okay, I'll assume it's monic. So I can write g as a product of distinct linear factors. Now, if we take the derivative, okay, the net effect, we just omit one factor at a time and then take the sum. So if I evaluate at the root alpha sub i, what we're gonna get is just gonna be the product of the differences. Now, because there are no multiple roots, this is non-zero, which means alpha sub i is not a root of g prime. So x minus alpha sub i does not divide g prime. That means there are no common factors between g and g prime, which is what we wanted to show. With that, we have the following corollary. Now, we're no longer assuming that every polynomial factors linearly over f. So we pick an irreducible polynomial g, coefficients in f, Characteristic of f is zero, and g has no multiple roots. The characteristic of f is equal to p, 
then g has multiple roots if and only if g can be written as a function of x to the p. In both cases, the degree of g prime is strictly less than the degree of g. If g prime is not zero, because g is irreducible, there are no common factors. That means there are no multiple roots. Now, this is always the case in characteristic zero. In characteristic p, what happens if g prime is zero? Well, we consider g, the constant term can go to zero, and for powers of x, they go to zero only if their exponents have a factor of p. So that means I could write g of x as a function of x to the p. Now, for examples, first we'll work over the rationals. So I'll just take a quadratic. We can solve that using the quadratic equation. For this to be irreducible over the rationals, that means the discriminant is not a square. And in that case, we'll have distinct roots by the plus and minus sign. Again, over the rationals, if we consider x to the n minus one with n greater than or equal to one, the derivative is gonna be n times x to the n minus one. And if I evaluate at any root, which will be an nth root of unity, we get something that's non-zero. So that says this polynomial has no multiple roots, confirming what we already know. There are n distinct nth roots of unity. Important example for later on, if I'm working over z mod p, so we have characteristic p, take the polynomial x to the p of the k minus x. The derivative is going to go to minus 1. So this polynomial has no multiple roots. Here's a good example in characteristic p. We let f be equal to z mod p with p prime. g of x equals x to the p plus 1. The derivative is equal to 0, so we can express g of x as a function of x to the p. Here, h of y equals y plus 1. How do we see the multiple roots? Now we know x to the p plus 1 equals x plus 1 to the pth power by the binomial theorem. So if p is a prime, p divides the binomial coefficient p choose i, when i is not equal to 0 or p. That means in this expansion, all the middle terms drop out, or left with x to the p plus 1. So a polynomial has a root at minus 1 with multiplicity p. We finish with definitions. We have k an extension of f. We'll call alpha and k separable over f if it satisfies a polynomial over f with no multiple roots. Then we'll call k a separable extension of f if every alpha and k is separable over f. Now we note in this case, every alpha satisfies a polynomial over f, okay, whether it has multiple roots or not. So a separable extension over f is always an algebraic extension over f. If I want to construct separable extensions, we don't want to adjoin any transcendentals. Now for examples, characteristic zero, every algebraic extension is separable. So I take an alpha and k, that's gonna satisfy some minimal polynomial, which is irreducible over f. And characteristic zero, irreducible means there are no multiple roots, so separable. Characteristic p, let's consider finite fields. Here we'll only consider finite extensions. So these are all separable. Now, we take f sub q, finite field with q elements. So q is going to be equal to p of the n with p of prime. Let's see if this is separable over z mod p. Now, every element of f sub q is going to be a root of the polynomial g of x equal to x to the q minus x. This follows because the group of units in f sub q forms a cyclic group under multiplication. Now, we've seen if we take the derivative, okay, q is a power of p, so we're going to get a minus 1. That means there are no multiple roots in this polynomial. So separable. Finally, to see what can go wrong, okay, we have to be in characteristic p. Let's consider rational functions in t over z mod p. So that's f. For the extension, we consider the rational functions in the pth root of t over z mod p. 
Now, this is not separable. So if I take the element, alpha equal to minus the pth root of t, this is gonna be a multiple root of the polynomial, x to the p plus t. But the same method we use over here. So we can rewrite this as x plus the pth root of t to the pth power. Now, some things to note here. Alpha is a root of this polynomial, so we have an algebraic extension. We also note, using Gauss's lemma, okay, with r equal to z mod p, a joint t, so polynomials in t over z mod p, that this is an irreducible polynomial. So it must be the minimal polynomial of alpha. That's a problem. If alpha is a root of any polynomial, that minimal polynomial must divide it. So that polynomial must have multiple roots. So not separable. 